on our website, uh, or I'm sure you can get them here today as well. So today we are joined by Dr. Matthew Lively of Morgantown, West Virginia. Before entering private practice three years ago, Dr. Lively spent 20 years as a faculty physician at the West Virginia University School of Medicine, where he conducted patient care, teaching, and research. He's the author of several articles on medical history topics, and his first book, Calamity at Chancellorsville, The Wounding and Death of Confederate General Stonewall Jackson, was published by Savas Beatty in 2013. Uh, and he does have some copies here available today uh, that he'd be happy to sign for you. Um, he will be back in the box office uh, after, after the presentation today. So I encourage you all to pick up a copy. Um, and I know he's also working uh, on what sounds like another fascinating book, uh, this one on Gettysburg. Uh, so maybe at the end of this talk, he'll uh, tell us a little bit about what that book will be. Um, he's here today to speak with us about the autopsy performed on Abraham Lincoln following his assassination. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Matthew Lively. Thank you, John Eric. Uh, can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. So well, I'm very uh, pleased to be here. I thank all of you for coming out and for those online also. And I'm uh, a little embarrassed to say this is the first time myself that I've been up here. I just live in Morgantown and um, shame to say that this is the first time I've come up to see the, the Civil War room, and it's a very impressive place. So I encourage all of you, if you haven't seen it, to, to go through it. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to come to speak to you today about uh, a subject that a lot of people, even people involved in the Civil War, don't know even occurred. And that was the autopsy that was performed on Abraham Lincoln uh, several hours after uh, after he died. Um, and so we're going to talk about that a little bit. You know, it's. It's one of those things where if you do any research in the Civil War or read a lot about the Civil War, you come across a very frustrating occurrence a lot of times where you have two people that will witness the exact same event and then write exactly opposite accounts of the event. Um, and then you're left with trying to decide you know, who's right if either one based on you know, what they said and other people said. And, and it happens then time and again. This is no, no exception. You would think these, you know, obviously historic events, people would have the same story, but you'll see that doesn't happen. Uh, and it gets somewhat frustrating uh, when you're doing the research. Uh, this is a talk that can get very quickly medically technical and uh, with anatomic jargon and so forth. I've tried to filter out as much of that as I can uh, so it doesn't you know, gloss over your eyes, but some of this has to sneak through. So we'll, we'll deal with it as it occurs, but we'll try to, try to get most of the technically medical part, part out of this. Uh, so as, as uh, Try the, uh, try the button on the side and make sure I thought it was turned on. You see the green on there. Okay, I'm going to do it for you. Okay, go Just ahead. let me know when you want to advance. Be a lot. <laughs> okay, as 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 you know, uh, you know, on the evening of April fourteenth, uh, eighteen sixty five, Abraham Lincoln attended a uh, uh, play at the Ford's Theater, and approximately approximately ten thirty p.m., John Wilkes Booth snuck into the presidential box, armed with. Uh, you got a pointer here. Um, that's armed a, with a pointer right there. There you go. Armed with this derringer and that dagger, and uh, shot uh, Abraham Abraham Lincoln next there. There's a lot of these. This is a picture of the presidential box, pretty much from the viewpoint where where um, a Booth would have come in. Lincoln would have been Lincoln would have been Lincoln would have been sitting in this chair um, and. We're having trouble hearing, and I'm wondering if I put the mic over here because you were Go moving around. Me. Would that help? Sure. On this side, that way we can turn around. Yeah, because I have lots of So Lincoln would have been sitting in, in this chair, um, and um, the uh, eyewitness events, people that that saw, that said they saw when, when he was shot, uh, that testified in the uh, conspiracy trial or, or in the newspaper articles later and said that 
like this one. At the moment the president was shot, he was leaning his hand on the railing, looking down at the orchestra. Um, or as another one says, at the moment the attack was made, he was leaning forward, resting his head on his hand in his accustomed Paris way, somewhat maybe like this 1861 portrait. The, the, the point of that is the stage is over here. Um, and if Lincoln had been looking towards the stage, um, his, the right side of his head would have been facing Booth as he came in. As you'll see, the entrance wound for Lincoln was actually on the left side of his head, uh, not the right. So he had to actually be looking down this way. Uh, otherwise, the ballistics don't, don't work out. So, but there are testify, testimony that he was looking left at the time. He was not looking at the stage at the time the uh, uh, shot occurred. So Lincoln is, is shot, you know, that then Booth uh, jumps on the stage and escapes. And um, one of the, there are several physicians in the audience at the, uh, at Fort Steer at the time. And one of them is Dr. Charles Leal, who's a military physician, pretty much about six, seven weeks out of training. He's relatively a fresh doctor. He's the first one to get into the box. He climbs into the box from the, from, they push him up and climbs into the box from the outside because Booth had jammed the door, getting into the box. Um, so he climbs up into the box. And he's the first one to get to Lincoln and to start to uh, to start treat and minister to find out what what happened. Um, so when he gets to when he gets to Lincoln, he says, you know, when I reached the president, he was in a state of general paralysis. His eyes were closed, and he was comatose. So Lincoln was unconscious almost from the start. So the time that the bullet hit him, to the time he died, he never really regained regained consciousness. Um, Lil was started to look to find out where he was wounded because at first he didn't know. So he started looking for where uh, where Lincoln was wounded. And when he came, um, sorry, when he came, yeah, it's gonna be a lot of this. He came, he said, I passed my fingers over a large firm clot of blood situated about an inch below the superior curved line of the occipital bone. The occipital bone is the bone that makes up the back of the skull. It's a very thick bone, makes up the back, the back of the skull. Um, so he finds a, a blood clot. Uh, back there, and then he realizes that at the time that this is that it's a headshot that Lincoln had been shot in the head. And he says, As soon as I removed my finger, slight oozing of blood followed, and his breathing became more regular and less stirrous. Stirrous it means difficult. And so, what had happened when you, when, when you get a, a, a bull wound to the head, the, obviously, there's bleeding that occurs inside the brain. And the brain, of course, is in a closed space, the skull is a very enclosed space. So, as that, as that fluid fills up, then there's increased pressure. The pressure has nowhere to go because it's against it. So the, so the pressure builds up in the brain instead because the skull keeps it closed. What will happen is that eventually starts to put pressures on the respiratory centers in the place where you breathe. And it'll, it'll, that's how people will die from increased pressure in their head. And this is what was happening at length of time. And so what happened when Lil moved that clot some from the outside, some of the blood oozed out and some of the pressure decreased in the brain and Link was able to breathe easier. And actually what, if he hadn't done it, Lincoln probably would have died in there in the box um, if he had not if he had not opened up the opened up and let some of the some of the blood relief. Really, really. So Lil's the first one there. Then eventually some other physicians that are there get into the box too um, and help Lil. And so they decide that they don't want to keep they, they, Lincoln's on the floor in the in the presidential box. They decide they don't want to keep him there. They need to move him, but they think he's the, they won't make it back to the White House. They think he's he's too um, in too critical condition. They'd never survive in the White House. So they take him across the street to the Peterson House, the Peterson boarding house. And you guys know the story about um, they take him to the back bedroom, and Lincoln's six foot four frame is too long for the bed, so they have to lay him on a diagonal in the bed. They even get him to fit on the bed. Um, this is the bed. That, the bloody pillow here that, that following his following his death. And so they take him to the Peterson house. And pretty much from there, there's a vigil. It's a vigil as to, you know, when he's going to die. Because all the physicians there knew that this was a fatal wound, that there wasn't anything they could do. That Lincoln eventually was going to die. There wasn't any way they could save him. Uh, so they pretty much just watch. And every now and then they would remove, again, they remove the clot of blood as it formed in this so that he would breathe. Either. Every time he started to have trouble breathing, they would open up the clot and breathe either again, try to relieve some of the pressure. But they knew that eventually it was going to catch up and they weren't going to be able to be able to save him. And this is kind of a chronological list of, that was taken at the time of, you know, his, his respiratory rate, his, his heart rate, and you can see some things like when Ms. Lincoln came in the room and when they came out. This was taken, some of the doctors kept this list, and, they, and you can see eventually at 722, the next day, April 15th, 722 in the morning, Lincoln, Lincoln finally, finally died. Um, so his, they, um, they decide that after his death, the Surgeon General of the Army, uh, Dr. Joseph Barnes, which we'll mention a little bit here, a little 
little bit more. He decides that we need, they need to do an autopsy because they know that eventually there's probably going to be a trial if they catch the assassin who's booth and there's going to be a trial and they need to establish officially Lincoln's cause of death and say that, you know, what, what he died of and how he died, even though they know it was a gunshot wound, they have to, they want to document all this for a future trial. Um, so they decide they need to do an autopsy. What they're going to do, they decide to do the autopsy at the White House. Uh, not, they're not going to do it at the Peterson House. Well, they had taken, when, when they had taken Lincoln to the Peterson House, they stripped him of all his clothes because they put warm compresses directly on his skin because his extremities were cold, he was in shock. So one of the things they did was, you know, put, put warm compress on. So Lincoln didn't have any clothes on the way to the Peterson House. So before they took him to the White House, they actually wrapped his body in an American flag. So they, put clothes, they wrapped his body in an American flag and then put him in a basic, you know, wooden casket and did a procession and took him back to the, to the, to the White House. They took him to what, a room in the northwest corner of the White House where these two windows are. At the time, it was called the Prince of Wales room because Prince of Wales had stayed there at, at one point uh, previously. And this is where they would do the autopsy. Now, this is a room, actually, this room contained what's known today as the Lincoln bed, uh, even though we don't think Lincoln ever slept in that bed. Um, the Lincoln bed was in this room. This is actually the same room where Lincoln's son, Willie, had, uh, had died of typhoid fever in 1862. Uh, so this was the room that they, uh, that they, they decided to perform the autopsy. One of the physicians there describes the room and says, the room contained with little furniture, large heavy curtain bed, which was the Lincoln bed. Um, sofa, bureau, wood, chairs, seated around with general officers, civilians, conversing in whispers. On one side, stretched upon a rough framework of boards and covered with only sheets and towels, lay cold and immovable, but, but a few hours was the soul of a great nation. So they, they weren't gonna do the autopsy with him in the bed, so they had made a makeshift, you know, makeshift table um, and placed Lincoln's body on that table and then proceeded with the autopsy. It was going to be a limited autopsy. The new was a, the only wound that Lincoln had was in the head, so they were going to autopsy the brain. They didn't have to do any other further autopsy. Um, now, these are the, the main gentlemen upon the said This is the Surgeon General of the Army, Joseph K. Barnes. So he's a Surgeon General. And he's the one that said, you decided that the reason for doing this was because they wanted to do post, post mortem examination of the remains that it might be necessary to establish, establish officially the cause of death by homicide. Because, you know, again, they knew there was going to be a trial, and so they knew they would have to testify to what happened to Lincoln, so they wanted to do, he, de he designated an autopsy to be performed to document Lincoln's cause of death. Um, he, Barnes designated two of his staff, Dr. Joseph Woodward and Edward Curtis, to actually perform the autopsy. Uh, Woodward was kind of a pathologist at the time. Um, and he was, direct, he was a lead physician. He was the one that actually did the, the, the autopsy itself. Curtis assisted him. Um, and then you have several other physicians that were in the room at the time, besides Dr. Barnes himself. This is Dr. Robert K. Stone, who was the Lincoln family physician. And if you ever uh, read anything about Lincoln's medical history, Dr. Stone pops up again and again. Every time there was somebody sick, even Lincoln or, or Willie Lincoln, whoever, Stone was always there. He was, he was there all the time. Uh, so he was there at the autopsy. Um, another military physician at the time, Dr. Charles Taft, uh, was there. Now Taft has the distinction of being the only physician that was actually at every every event in this course. So he was one of the ones that got in the box. He was at Fort Theater. He was got in the box and helped Leo uh, when when uh, Lincoln first got shot. And then he was at the Peterson House the whole time before Lincoln died. And then he was invited to the autopsy afterwards and he did he go to that. Now, Dr. Leal was also invited to the autopsy. He was at he was obviously the first one to treat Lincoln and he was at the Peterson house the whole time. And then Barnes invited him to the autopsy but he declined said he needed to go back to his regular job and take care of his own patients and couldn't go to the autopsy so he did not go. But Taft was the only one that was there the, the whole time. And there were two other physicians that were on Barnes's staff, Dr. Knotson and Dr. Crane, uh, who were also at the autopsy. Now, all of these physicians, with the exception of these two, wrote about one way or another, wrote or testified about the autopsy at some point, which we'll talk about you immediately after or for you several years later. There's I've yet to see anything ever written by Crane or Knotson. Um, I don't know if they ever did write anything, maybe it'll pop up sometime, but we know they were there because all these other physicians mentioned them as being there. Everybody you know, those that did write about the autopsy said that these were the physicians that were there at the time, and everybody mentions these two as being there, even though they themselves didn't seem to write anything about, about the event. Uh, so the autopsy starts, Woodward's going to start the autopsy. Uh, 
Um, so his first, um, first, first description of it is to describe the entrance wound. Uh, and so he says the entrance wound, there was a gunshot wound to the head around the skull, which was greatly thickened by hemorrhage. The ball had entered through the occipital bone an inch to the left of the median line. So remember, it went in the back of the skull a little bit to the left from midline. So it was a left, it was a left shot right here. Uh, so Lincoln had to be looking towards the left when, when the shot occurred, otherwise the, 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 the ballistics wouldn't happen. Um, the, um, Dr. Stone also wrote about it, we'll talk about it. He, he says that uh, they proceeded the examination by dividing, dividing the scalp from ear to ear and sawing off the calvarium, which is the skull. Um, when the scalp was removed, they found that the ball had pierced out a simple bone one inch to the left of the knee line. Same, same description. When they did this autopsy, what they did is they took the, the skin, they cut the skin from ear to ear behind, okay, around here, and they took the, the scalp and they actually flipped it up over, up and over the skull and over the face. They put the, and then they took with the saw, they would cut the skull cap off so they could get to the brain. This is how they actually performed perform the autopsy, and that's what that's what Stone is uh, describing there, is how they actually took off the, and then they would take it, and after they got this, the brain exposed, they would take a very sharp knife, and they would slice the brain down in layers until they got to the track of the ball. That's what they were trying to find out where the track of the ball, so they sliced the brain down until they could get to where the, to where the track of the ball was. And Woodward mentions that, he says that fragment, as they were doing this, the fragment of the ball was found in the orifice through the bone, the track of the ball was full of clotted blood and contained several small fragments of bone. So when the bullet went through the, the very thick bone, it actually a little piece of the bone, a little piece of the bullet broke off and it was found in the in the track of the wound. And then there were several pieces of bone fragments that also were transported into the track of the ball with it that the ball took with it. So not only did you have the ball as a projectile in the brain, you had several bone fragments. And these are actually the actual bone fragments um, that were there. These are these are the fragments from, from Lincoln's. Uh, brain from the skull uh, that were taken from the autopsy. These are housed at the National Museum of Health and Medicine in Washington, D.C. And these were the these are the bone fragments from the uh, from the autopsy that occurred. Uh, Stone mentions in a little bit more detail. He says that about two and a half inches in the orifice, first piece of occipital bone driven in by the ball was discovered. The second larger fragment was discovered further about four inches. So I mean, the the, the bullet went in about seven seven and a half eight inches into his brain, but, so, but there was bullet, there was the bone fragments that even went in the orifice too, so it was quite a bit of damage that would have occurred both, uh, both from all this. Now they, they found the track of the ball, but they didn't see the ball itself. So they, were seen, they, they didn't see the ball sitting there, they found the track of the ball, but they haven't found the ball itself yet sitting there. Um, that's what they're looking to see where the, where, the, where the ball ended up, but they don't see it. And so, uh, uh, okay. and so what they do, is Kerr says, not finding it readily, meaning the ball, um, we proceeded to remove the entire brain. Uh, when I was lifting the ladder from the cavity of the skull, suddenly the bolt dropped out through my fingers and fell, breaking the solemn silence of the room with its clatter into an empty basin that was standing beneath. So as he took the brain out, the ball, wherever it was, fell out on the floor. And so they never actually saw where the bullet was or where it sat. All they had was a track of the ball. They, had, they only knew that uh, when they pulled the brain out that the, uh, that the bullet had fallen. Taft uh, confirms that he says, after removing the brain from the cranium, the ball dropped from its lodgment in the anterior lobe. This is the actual ball, um, again, um, that occurred. Um, Stone describes it uh, more specifically, said it was a lead handmade ball. Uh, it was flattened somewhat in its passage through the skull and a portion had been cut off the bone through the bone. So that was a piece that they found you know, in the straight into the entrance wound, a little piece of the ball. And when it hit the when it hit the bone and went through it, it actually flattened some. So it's not a round ball. It's a it's a you know, more flattened projectile. This is also in at the National Museum of Health and, and Medicine, D.C., along with the bone fragments. That's where this that's where the, the bullet um, occurred or resides uh, to this day on on, exhi on uh, exhibit. Uh, but again, they didn't see it. It had fallen. It had fallen out. So they don't know exactly where the ball had sat. Now this is, Woodward, I told you, was the one that, that did the autopsy. He was the official one. So he wrote the official report of the autopsy. And this is his handwritten notes immediately after the autopsy. You can see there's bloodstained notes. You assume that's Lincoln's blood. I don't know who else's blood it would be after the autopsy. But these are his hand, handwritten notes that he, that he did um, after his autopsy for the official report. And he says the ball, Passed through the left ear, posterior lobe of the cerebrum, which is the upper part of the brain, entered the left lateral ventricle. Ventricles are, are fluid filled 
cavities in the brain. There's one on the left and one on the right side. Um, entered the left lateral ventricle, lodged in the white matter of the cerebrum just above the anterior portion of the left corpus striatum. Corpus striatum is a, is a structure that's in kind of the anterior mid part of the brain. But the point is what, what, what we're saying is the ball entered the left side of the uh, left side of the skull and stayed on the left side of the brain. Uh, it didn't, it, it was just, it was, so it was completely on the, on the left side of, uh, of the brain. Dr. Stone also told you it was there. He also wrote uh, account of it almost immediately after the autopsy occurred. I guess the only paper he had was a blank prescription pad. Uh, so this is why it's a pharmacist's a pad. He wrote uh, his, uh, his notes uh, of the autopsy. And he says, the ball entered left lateral ventricle. Uh, course of followed that course uh, very accurately, inclining upwards and inwards and lodged in the white cerebral substance just above the corpus striatum on the left side. So same thing Woodward says, pretty much word for word, uh, no controversy there, right? Same thing, entered the left side of the brain, stayed on the left side of the brain. So far, so good. What about Curtis, the one, the other one that helped Woodward with the, with the autopsy? Well, he didn't write anything immediately after, but several days later, he sent a letter to his mom where he described the autopsy in detail. I mean, what a letter home, right? He sends a letter to his mom and describes the whole autopsy that was performed. Uh, and then he's a little bit more cryptic about, you know, where he is. He says, the ball entered a little left of the median line at the back of the head, passed almost directly forward through the center of the brain and lodged. So he doesn't say exactly, but I mean, if, you, if you read between, he says it went, it's almost directly forward. So it entered the left and stayed forward. So you would assume that means it stayed, it didn't veer one way or the other. Um, it was the same would stay on the left side. He doesn't specifically say where, where the track of the ball ended, but if you had to put him in one category, you would, I guess you would assume it was left side because he says it went directly forward and didn't veer. So, so far, so good, no problem. Where's the controversy? Well, the controversy becomes from the other people's writing, like Dr. Charles Taft, I told you, was there and wrote about, wrote about this in a journal after, in his journal after the event, and then for several years later, wrote many medical articles and lectured and stuff about the, about the autopsy and about Lincoln's assassination. Uh, well, in his notes, he says, the tracking ball, which was plainly indicated uh, by a line of coagulated blood, ex blood extending from the external wound, the occipital wound, obliquely across from left to right, uh, through the brain to the anterior lobe, immediately behind the right orbit. So now suddenly Taft says the ball crossed the midline. It came to the left and ended up over the right side of the brain, which is different than what we have with the other people that were there. And so Taft, suddenly we have a little bit of, I said, one of those instances where people witness the same thing and write something direct, you know, opposite. So Taft is saying that it was, it was on the right side. Well, how about Joseph Barnes? Well, the Surgeon General was there. He didn't write anything specifically because he was just letting Woodward write the official report. But in the trial of John Surratt in 1867, a couple of years later, he testified about the Lincoln assassination, testified about the autopsy. And in the, in the testimony, he says, the ball entered the left and middle line, below the line of the ear, ranged forward and upward towards the right eye, lodging within a half inch of that organ. So Barnes' recollection of the autopsy himself is that the ball went to the right side also. So now suddenly now we have two and two. We've got two people say it was the left side, two people said the right side. And you got Curtis is kind of, if you had to put him one way or another, maybe you put him on the left side, but he's, you know, you got, you got you have two and two. And so there's a, now we got the controversy as to where the track of the ball went uh, based on the people that were there. Now, for completeness sake, I'm going to mention one other account. And this is by Dr. Lyman Beecher Todd, who was actually Mary Todd Lincoln's cousin. And he was a physician, and he was there at the Peterson House. There's no question he was there because other people documented his being there. But 30 years later, in 1895, he writes an account of the assassination and about the autopsy. And he says, I was at the autopsy. And he writes a very detailed, an extremely detailed account of the autopsy. And sometimes when you first, when you see that, something like that 30 years later, that sometimes that's a red flag already. I think people, when they remember that much detail, maybe they're, you know, embellishing a little bit. But he writes a very detailed um, account of the autopsy uh, in this, in this, and in it he says the bullet laid a dark fur through the brain and was found in the brain tissue immediately behind the right eye. So he's back to he's saying right eye. The problem is, is I don't think he was actually there. Um, the um, I mentioned that um, we know he was at the Peterson House because other people mentioned him as being there. But remember, I told you all, all those physicians that wrote, documented everybody that was there. Nobody mentions him. He's not mentioned by any other physician as being at the autopsy. He self-reports himself being there 30 years later. Uh, so that's 
a little bit of a question, you know, makes a little skeptical of whether he was there or not. Then there's some other issues with his account that are a little bit that, that question whether he was there. One of them says that they found the ball in the brain. And when the, when the pair of forceps, Dr. Barnes or the Surgeon General, raised the bullet from its place, he then placed the bullet upon the palm of the hand of each person present and filing this pocket case. So he's saying they found the ball and, and Barnes took forceps, took it out, and then put it in his pocket. Well, what we know they didn't have, we know the ball fell out, you know, the brain, when they took the brain out, that they didn't see it in the brain. The other thing, the other problem is that Barnes, Dr. Barnes never kept the bullet. After, when the bullet was taken out, what happened is Dr. Stone actually got the bullet. Um, he scraped, he scratched an AL into the bullet to identify the, to identify the bullet. Then he put it in an envelope and sealed it in an envelope. And then after the autopsy, gave it to Secretary of War Stanton. Uh, who then put that envelope in another envelope and signed his name to it and sealed it. And that was eventually opened up at the, at the, the conspirators trial to identify. So Stone was there and identified that bullet. So yeah, this is my mark I put in the bullet at the time. Um, that's also how the bone fragments arrived. They put the bone fragments in the envelope too and gave it to Stanton. That's why those, those things survived and are still in the museum. So we know that the bullet, that, that Barnes didn't keep the bullet, that it was Stone. So this part of the story also is not true uh, because it was stone that sealed the bullet in an envelope and, and Barnes never never kept it. In fact, in the trial, that throughout the trial, Barnes couldn't identify the bullet. They asked him, could you identify a bullet if you saw it? He said no. And so so this part's not, not, not true. And then the other part that's wrong, that's, that's questionable, is he says that when it was all over, General Hart was one of the military uh, people there was kind of serving as a guard, handed me a pair of scissors, requested me to cut a few locks of hair from Mrs. Lincoln. I carefully cut and delivered them and then secured one for myself. When the autopsy was going on, Mary Todd Lincoln was across the room in, a, in another, it was across the hall in another, in another room. They were obviously going to let her be in the autopsy. But she did ask for a lock of, of hair from her husband. Um, and she did do it. But the person that did that, it's documented by the other physician, was Dr. Dr. Stone. It was Stone who then who took, who cut some of the hair around the entrance wound area. Um, and then gave it for them to, to give them Mrs. Lincoln across the hallway. And then he cut some for himself, and then he cut some for some of the other people in the room, some of the other physicians. And, you know, it's kind of, you know, back, back in the Victorian days, that was a big thing. It's kind of odd to us today, but it was a big thing to take care of deceased people. Um, and so after, at the autopsy, there were several, several blocks of Lincoln's hair was taken. And then it was even like a, there was document that the undertaker later took some hair out of Lincoln. Um, and the, the thing that, that gives, at least gives Todd a little bit of, makes this a little bit of question is, is that Todd did wind up with a lock of Lincoln's hair. Um, in fact, it went up for auction several years ago for tens of thousands of dollars. But he probably got this at the Peterson house. Because uh, remember, we know that he was there and lots of people took locks of his hair at the Peterson house. So once Lincoln had died, um, people started cutting his hair. Stanton got some of his hair, other doctors got some of his hair. It was, it's a wonder Lincoln was buried with any hair at all, but, People just start cutting his hair after he died, both at the Peterson house and at the autopsy, and then, and then when he was embalmed, they start taking hair. Um, so Todd did wind up with a piece of Lincoln's hair, but it was probably obtained at the, at the Peterson house, not during the autopsy. And so that's why I'll mention this because it's out there, but I think I don't think Todd was actually at the autopsy. So I, so I discount his account of the, I think he just wrote this about it being on the right side because he used other people like Taft's writing, wrote, I told you, wrote several medical journal articles about the assassination said it was on the right side. I think he was just using what other people had written and, and placed himself in the historic event, you know, 30 years later. That was not an unusual thing that happened sometimes with reading these civil war people put themselves somewhere where they weren't um, later on. So we're back to having two and two, right? More or less two on the left side, two on the right side, maybe one, maybe another that's kind of to the, to the left. So is there anything else that could help us decide where the path of the ball when, well, how about the physical exam that Lincoln had, you know, when, when, when they looked at him when he, before he died, when they took him to the Peterson house? Because when you have increased pressure in the brain, uh, what will happen many times is the, that pressure also um, compresses the optic nerve in the eye and it will cause one pupil to dilate, right? It will cause a pupil to dilate and not be reactive. And for almost, you know, all the time that, that the pupil that dilates is on the same side of the of the pressure to bleed. So if the left pupil's dilated, that means there's more pressure on the left side of the brain, more bleeding there. And so how about that? Is there anything that may help us help us uh, with that? Well, Dr. Taft, or I mean, so Dr. Stone, again, um, who wrote in his account, he does mention that says, 
This is at the Peterson House. Um, I was, uh, it was remarked that the president's left eye was blackened. The periphery of oral surface ecomos, ecomos means bruised. Um, the ordinary appearance of a black eye. This was also noted. The pupil of the right eye was very much dilated and mobile. The left pupil was unchanged, or if anything was rather myopic or diminished. So he's saying that initially the right pupil was dilated uh, in Lincoln. So that would give you an idea that maybe there was more pressure on the right side of the brain than the left immediately after the after the gun, shortly after the gunshot wound. So maybe there was more pressure on the right side. Maybe the bullet did get transverse to the right side because there, you know, there wasn't any other, otherwise would have been any damage in the right side of the brain necessarily. So maybe there was pressure. So maybe this is the right side. Well, well and good. But remember Charles Lill, the guy that was that was also there at the first. Well, Lill wrote about the whole thing afterwards too, and he says when the president was first laid in bed at the Peterson House, a slight ecchymosis again was noted in the left eyelid, and the pupil of that eye was dilated, while the pupil of the right eye was contracted. So again, two people with the exact same physical exams, exactly opposite. Right? Stone says. Stone says right eye was dilated, Chill says the left one dilated. So again, it's a push. You know, nobody knows. That doesn't help as much. They both they both kind of cancel each other out, I guess, in a sense. So we're kind of left again with the with the with you know two on one and two on the other. Um, so that kind of you know makes it makes it push. So which one's right? Well, um, you know, this this controversy didn't go without without notice. You know, following, following the Civil War, um, Barnes um, decided to put together a, all the medical records that survived of the Civil War, both the Union and Confederate. Now, most of the Confederate medical records didn't survive because they were burned in, in Richmond in 1865. But all of the, the surviving uh, Union medical records were put together in a compilation uh, called The Medical and Surgical History of the War of the Rebellion. It's a six volume work, a very large six volume work that was published over several years from 1870 on. And in it, it's a very amazing resource. I mean, it's got it's got every statistic, um, every disease. How what armies have what diseases? It's got um, uh, thousands upon thousands of case studies uh, of um, you know uh, uh, soldiers and what wounds they had and how they were treated and how they survived. And they they've got them all put in the different you know gunshot wounds to the chest, gunshot wounds to the head, gunshot you know, what? It's an amazing resource. When they put this together, this is this is Barnes staff at the time. And, um, Actually, four of these gentlemen were there at the autopsy. This is Dr. Barnes, who mentioned himself as Surgeon General. This is Curtis, remember, who was there. And this is Woodward, who actually performed the autopsy. And this is Crane here, who was also there. Um, now, this is Dr. Otis, who was the editor, was the, was the one who was editing this volume of the, of the uh, Medic Search Hurster, or the Rebellion, which we'll talk about. Um, well, they put Lincoln's case in there. Okay, they put Lincoln's case in the medical surgical history award, and this is it. They didn't identify him specifically. It's a case AL. They didn't say Abraham Lincoln. They put him as AL. But there's no question this is him. As you see, it was about, um, you know, was shot in Washington in the evening of April 14th, and, and they mentioned Dr. Leo, and they put in what he was talking about. They mentioned Taft down in here, and they say down in here that the autopsy um, was performed under the direction of the Surgeon General, Woodward, and, and Curtis did it. So they put, the, they put Lincoln's case study in here in the uh, medical search of the war the rebellion um, and of course they use woodward since he wrote the official report they use him as the official report but but when they but when they were discussing this case because it had other elements that I mean, technical stuff you know to get into they they mentioned some other stuff they mentioned what other people had written about the autopsy or about the bullet wound and stuff later on in, in the years and they mentioned some of those people that said stuff, but and it got to the point where there was question of that the, that Otis had to put that Otis put in a little footnote at the end that says, among other inaccuracies, the report and these are some of the other reports describes the ball as passing into the right hemisphere. So he says, no, it didn't happen. All these people that wrote that that the ball crossed the right. That's all wrong. You know, it was left side. Official reports left side of left side, and anybody else that says the right side. Of um, and so that's what ended up in the medical history of the War of the Rebellion is that it was left side. They said that this controversy should be a controversy. It was all on the left side. But you know, it's, it's funny because you may not be able to read it from here, but um, it's uh, even this, the things that always get you a little bit, you know, those, the, you have that and you're like, okay, then something else pops up. If you read, if you read this very closely, you might not be able to see it from here, but they they mark they, they talk about that exam we mentioned about Lincoln 
when he was at the Peterson house. And they used, they used Lil as the, who wrote the stuff. They used his, and they said here that, um, that over the left eyelid, there was slight ecchymosis, right? So the left eyelid was bruised. Then they put, quote, the pupil of that eye was slightly dilated. The left pupil was contracted. Wait a minute, same pupil. He said the, he says the, left, the left eye was ecchymosed and the pupil of that eye was dilated and the left pupil was contracted. So this is a misprint. This is a misprint in the official record because you see this is a quote. This is an exact quote. They quote the pupil that, and this is directly out of Leo's writing. And in his writing, this should say right instead of left, the right people, which we mentioned before. So this is a misprint in the official report, but it's enough that if you just glance over that look, you're like, okay, well, that's a, so now you're confused again. And so that's why you have to be very careful when your you know, research is so warm. You have to read everything and be very careful because sometimes there's even just misprints, they, you know, and they get things, get things wrong. You still have to try to sort through all this. But the official report, um, said the left the left side so so which is right well i will never know for sure you know which is right but i think that i think that you've got to pretty much i think you have to have, you have to have more substantial evidence to go against probably what woodward wrote i mean woodward was the one who did the autopsy he wrote the official report um he was one that performed it and you know the other ones like Tafta were, were observers they weren't they weren't right there over his shoulder they were kind of watching so yeah i think it's with I think you have to have more substantial evidence to try to dis discount what the official report and the, the person that wrote me and he wrote again he wrote it immediately after that you know he did the autopsy in the bloodstained pages he wrote the, the, the report so you got to kind of give him more of the benefit of the doubt than anybody else so i think that what probably happened is this is you know this is a track of the bullet entered the left side in the back went through the brain this is the this is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle the corpus tram is in, uh, right up in here, so this would be the left, so it stayed here on the left side. You see Lincoln was looking down a little bit, so it was a little bit of a miss the brain stem, so it didn't kill him instantly. Um, but the bullet probably lodged up here somewhere on the left side of the brain. It's probably, at least that's the official report. And, you know, I think that that's, that's, you have to kind of deal with that, uh, even though there's controversies as to what it happened. Well, so, you know, a lot of people say, what difference does it make, right? You know, Lincoln was shot, he was shot in the head, he died, who cares where, you know, which side of the, which side of the ball went. Well, I don't think you find any historians say that. I mean, historians like to get things, you know, like to get things right and like to get the details. I mean, if you had that philosophy, then you could, you know, you could extend that to the whole Civil War. Like, I don't know why you pay attention to the Civil War. North and one, South lost. Who cares about the battles? Who cares what happened there, right? Uh, but you're not. I mean, the reason you guys are here and everybody else is watching is because, you know, you're interested in this type of stuff. So you want to get the details. You want to get it right. So I think that's why it's important, at least from you know, people like me and historians type stuff, is to where, you know, get the, where did it happen? Was it, you know, what, 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 uh, what happened? And what happened exactly, as best you can tell. The other thing this does is, you know, it, it gives a little bit of fodder. Everybody likes what ifs. And the Civil War is no, no, you know, no exception. And the biggest what if of the Civil War is probably, you know, what if Jackson had survived and was at Gettysburg, right? Had, would the battle have changed, right? Well, from a medical standpoint, people like to debate, like to debate, you know, like to debate Lincoln, right? So this is just some, you know, examples of many of the articles over the years that have, you know, occurred about Lincoln, you know, you know saving President Lincoln, an update on, you know, clinicians, you know, the case of Abraham Lincoln. And the most common thing people would, if, debate sometimes is this, would Lincoln have survived if he was shot today, right? It gives people, you know, something to, something to talk about. And then the reason this is important, where it makes a difference, because most, most bullet, bullet wounds to the head are fatal, but they're even more fatal if they cross the middle. If they stay on one side, they're not as, they're, the, the mortality is less than if a bullet actually traverses across the brain. So this is what gives people some people sit around and, and talk about. Um, besides just, uh, you know, another, another what if, um, and that's another reason people debate this, at least in a medical standpoint, sometimes where the ball was and where did it end up and why it makes a, why it makes a difference. Um, but you know, that's, that's, uh, that's the, that's the story. So I hope, uh, I think it stayed on the left side. I think it, I think it's where it was and we don't know, but, uh, I hope, uh, hope maybe you guys got learned something about an event. Uh, today that you didn't uh, you didn't know happened um, and learned a little bit. Tried to keep the medical stuff out of it too much, uh, but uh, be happy to try to answer any questions that uh, you might have about about Lincoln and the autopsy. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes, sir.
Okay, so the question is what caliber was the bullet? It was a 44 caliber Derringer, but the bullet was 41. They measured the bullet as being 41 caliber. So it it fit into the barrel, but then they had to put a, had to put a wad of stuff around it to keep it. But if the bullet measured 41 caliber, it was a 44 caliber, caliber Derringer. I think that's a good question. Yes. Um, the notebook's kind of a forensics type of thing too. Uh, hopefully it'll be, it's, um, um, it's taken unique medical events at the battle at Gettysburg at first, and maybe hopefully it will be a series of different battles. But at first, it's uh, different chapters, of different events. Like the first one, like was about uh, General Reynolds, who was shot again in the back of the head. And there's only one place that you can be. There's only one place that you can actually be shot where you die instantly. And everybody always talks about the Civil War. You know, this person was shot and died instantly. This person shot and died instantly. There's only one place that actually that can happen. It's at the brainstem back here, Ren. You get shot in the chest and live for minutes. Even shot in the heart and live for minutes. Um, and so it's, a, it's about stuff like that, like Reynolds and did his wound actually occur or the brain stem. And then it's, it's different medical, unique medical events like that, the little forensics part of it. So like Reynolds is a chapter. Actually, I put uh, Lincoln. Lincoln, a lot of people don't know that uh, even though Lincoln wasn't at Gettysburg, at the Gettysburg address, Lincoln had smallpox. Um, Lincoln ended up having smallpox while he gave the Gettysburg address. He got really sick on the train and went back to Washington, D.C. And he and much like today, he was for for uh, two for two to four weeks, and then he was quarantined in the White House. People couldn't come and see him. The Stone, Doctor Stone, made everybody in the White House get vaccinated, um, and all the staff had to get vaccinated for smallpox. Anybody was around Lincoln, so it's actually very much like today. So the the, the fact that Lincoln got smallpox was uh, so it's, it's chapters. That's what the that's hopefully what it'll be about different different unique medical events and kind of a forensics approach to. What what happened actually like this? What really happened? What didn't happen? Any other questions? We have, we have several questions online. Okay, well, let me, okay, one more here, and we'll get those. But, okay, whoever. I don't, yeah, I don't know when the first one occurred. There was several that occurred during the Civil War sometimes. I mean, they, 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 yes, yeah, it was a fairly new thing. Like I said, Woodward was kind of an early pathologist. Um, that's why that's why Barnes had him do the autopsy, because he was actually collecting specimens for the Army Medical Museum. You know, that's how, like, Down Sickle's leg wound up in the museum and stuff. He was, Woodward was actually collecting things for a museum. And so there was some autopsies that were going on and, 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 and things that were, were being uh, uh, kept to to make a pathology kind of thing. So that's so there were some. Not everybody obviously got autopsy, but sometimes if they weren't sure what somebody died of, they they would do a they would do an autopsy and then an autopsy. And again, Lincoln's is because Mars knew there was going to be a trial, so people have to testify that you know it was this bullet that killed him, and that's you know Booth had it. So. Yeah. yeah, I think I think you know, I think one thing they didn't want to bury Lincoln with a bullet in his brain. I think it was one thing they didn't want to leave a bullet in his brain. Um, and then the other thing is that you know, again, they wanted to they 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 knew that that based on the, the that there was to be a trial and they had that you know they, Stanton of course was running everything. Stanton wanted every you know he was looking for booth looking for and I think they knew there was to be a trial and they wanted to make sure that every you know every T was crossed and every I dotted. And so they wanted everything exactly right. So you know when they the interesting thing is that when they did the so when they did that's why they only did the autopsy of the brain, right? They didn't do anything else, but they knew that was a that it was a, the brain was where the where the bullet was. They didn't have to do any other autopsy. And and the fact that you know once they took the once they took the skull off, they put the skull cap back on. You could flip the skin back over the head and sew it back together. And that's why you could when you look, you see that one picture like upstairs of Lincoln and. You can't tell that an autopsy was done because they flipped the skin back over. So you couldn't even tell that an autopsy was done. Um, so yeah, I think they knew that they could do a limited autopsy and not not show any desecration of the body in a sense and for the medical stance. That's what that's what they did. But it didn't seem to be a question that you know they, they seemed I mean and this was done, you know, Lincoln died at 7:22. The autopsy occurred at 12 o'clock. I mean it was just you know five hours later, they went straight to the autopsy. Do you have something? Yes. Um, was Dr. Taft any relation to William Howard Taft? And was Dr. Todd any relation to Mary Lincoln? So, Mary, so Dr. Todd was a cousin of Mary, 
Lincoln thought. So he was he was Barry Todd Lincoln's cousin. And so that's part of why he was, you know, involved in some of this stuff. But again, I don't think it's at the autopsy. The Taft, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that one. I don't know if Taft was related to present Taft at all. I don't, I don't know the answer to that one. Has a DNA tissue sample analysis ever been made of Lincoln? Yes and no. There was, because, you know, this all gets back to this whole story about where Lincoln had Marfan syndrome or not, or this other genetic disease that people say Lincoln had. Um, so they did take some, there was, and there's one doctor that's specifically, you know, spearheaded this for years. They did take a blood sample, but it's not sure one that it was Lincoln's blood for sure, but it was, it was, it was from, um, I can't think of her name, but one of the actresses that had Lincoln's blood on her dress after the assassination. So they, they took some samples of, of that. But remember, Rathbone, who was there, was also bleeding heavily. There was a lot of blood in the box. It wasn't just Lincoln, because Major Rathbone, who was there, got stabbed by Booth and was bleeding quite heavily from you know, his arm. So there was blood everywhere in Booth and stuff. And so, um, but they did, take, they did take some blood, uh, or they did take a sample and tried to test. And they were really looking for genetic, this genetic disease, um, which is different, was MEN disease. Um, but, they didn't find it, um, but it was also inconclusive as to whether it was really Lincoln's blood or not. So, you know, they, they periodically have asked people, like some people have asked, like, can we, because there's, there's, you know, there's um, uh, uh, Curtis who did the, who did the autopsy, was with the autopsy. He had his cuffs that he wore were blood stained during the autopsy. And those survived, those have still survived. Um, and some other things that you, know, that, that you know Lincoln's blood's there, but nobody will, Nobody wants to, to damage these historic artifacts by taking blood or scrapes with. So they've asked like the Smithsonian or whoever has some of this, these artifacts, can we take them? They, they've always declined because they said, no, it doesn't, it's not worth, it's not worth, you know, damaging a historic artifact just to try to answer somebody's question that they're wondering about. So yes and no, the answer is not conclusively. Yeah, and the, and the next question is along the same lines. Could the bone fragments be used to extract DNA for future cloning? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> that, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know how much of the DNA in the, in the bone, in the, it, it would have to come out of the bone marrow, and I don't know how much bone marrow survived after that much, you know, after 160-some years. So that's a question I don't know, but, um, but, but that hasn't been done yet, I know. Jan asks, where is the museum in D.C. that houses the bone fragments? So it's in Silver Spring, Maryland. It's actually the National Museum of Health and Medicine. Um, and it used to be like, this. it used to be the Army of Medical Pathology. It, it had other names in the past, but it's, the, it's in Silver Spring, Maryland. So it's right outside, right outside D.C. And the last question we have online, uh, were there any photos taken during the autopsy? No. Not that we know of it. So the only people that were there supposedly were the physicians. Um, uh, Orville Browning was one of a friend, personal friend of Abraham Lincoln's that you'll see pop. He was actually at the, he was actually at the autopsy, um, documented as being at the autopsy. Um, but no, there wasn't uh, there wasn't any no there wasn't any photographer reporters there. It was a very it was a very private type of um, situation. Somebody else had a question. Yes, sir. Uh, well, first of all, that doctor who wrote the report, who was in the room, mm -hmm. I mean, did he face any repercussions? I mean, you hear about a lot of today of people making up stories. So in that case, he wasn't in the room, yet he writes up this detailed report. Was there any kind of uh, response to that that said you're a liar, or did you get some uh, benefit out of doing this, or was it for his own personal ego? Secondly, did anybody want to come with a camera? Is there any record that somebody put the field photography in the end? Is there any record that someone wanted to come into the room with a camera? And lastly, where was the ball? Who was involved, I believe? What did that happen? Yep. So the answer to the first question is no, I don't know if anybody ever said anything because this was Did you repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry. First question was did the Todd, the Dr. Todd um, face any repercussions from writing that he was at the autopsy when he probably wasn't. I haven't seen that. And again, this was 30 years later. So a lot of the people that were, weren't even, I mean, he wrote this in 1895. So it was 30 years after the fact. Um, and I think everybody just, it, it wasn't widely publicized. And so, I mean, I, I know it's out there. Um, and the only way it became really publicized now because that, that, that lock of hair that he had went up for auction. 
Um, and that's when people said, oh, look, he wrote that, that this came from the autopsy. Um, so I don't think it was a big, it wasn't like printed in papers and everything. I think it was more of that he was writing for other people. But I don't know of any repercussions. I don't think anybody charged him with, with lying. I don't think it mattered much to people. But I think from a historical standpoint, that's that's the case. I don't think, I just think he's placed himself somewhere where he wasn't. Uh, again, there was no, I don't know, I haven't read of anything of photography with this if anybody wanted to take pictures in there. I don't, I didn't see anywhere that anybody requested. I think, again, I think that Barnes, the Surgeon General wouldn't have allowed it probably. And, I, and if Stanton had known about it, you know Stanton would have, because remember Stanton was, you know, even that Lincoln, you know, Stanton didn't want any pictures taken of Lincoln after he died. You know, that's why there's hardly, there's only that one that survives that we know him in his casket, because nobody in Stanton didn't win. He confiscated that one, right? When, I, when he found out, he confiscated that one. Oh. Um, so, no, there, as far as I know, there was no, uh, nobody even yeah, asked to take, no. take photos of the, of the autopsy. Remember that guy um, wanted to And then that, the that third one was, was, was involved in where, yes, it was involved, well, and he was involved yeah. in that room it, right after the autopsy. So after the, after the autopsy um, was yeah. finished, uh, yeah. the undertaker, and I can't remember his name, came in and did the, the embalming right there in that same, in that same room. Yeah. I think there's probably a better than average chance today that, 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 that he would probably have survived, especially if he was president when it was shot. Because, you know, now, you know, the, the medical care for the president now is 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 immediate you know when when a president goes somewhere the nearest trauma one center has to be you know they have an operating room that's empty and, and waiting and, and every you know every uh, specialist is on call that you know it's immediate there's no delay in any type and um and i think that i think that probably he would have survived now what physical state had been and how functional he would have been i don't know you know people nowadays like to look back and compare it to gabby giffords uh, the congresswoman who, you know, 10 years ago was shot because she had a left side head. Her shot was a bull shot. And it only stayed on the left side of the head. It didn't cross the midline. And she survives today and is fairly functional. You can't compare exactly because it's kind of apples and oranges because that was a high velocity round. This was a low velocity round. And so, but, but still, so I think there's probably a better than average chance that Lincoln had survived, would have survived. But, uh, but yeah, what what physical state he had been in. You know, and the, the, the more interesting part of that, at least for me, is, is not if he survived today. What if happened if he had survived at the time? Because there were some people that did survive gunshot wounds at the time. It wasn't very common, but it did. Because the interesting thing is who was going to be present? Because there was no, at the time, there was no process for the vice president to take over for the president when he was incapacitated. Everything we know about succession now happened in the 25th Amendment, 1967. So the only way the vice president legally took over as president is the president died. So if Lincoln was still alive, who's president? Now, he's president, but who runs the country? Um, and it's been on what state he is, you know, because it actually happened like with Garfield 17 years later. Garfield got shot and lived for like several months. His cabinet kind of ran the country because the vice president. And, and Woodrow Wilson, who had a stroke in the early 1900s, he completed his term, but people say his wife pretty much ran the country. Um, and you couldn't have Mary Tom Lincoln from the country, right? Um, so the interesting thing would have been, you know, what would have happened with Reconstruction and all that stuff? Because Johnson wouldn't have become president if Lincoln had survived, even in a somewhat, you know, you know, incapacitated state. There was no legal way for anybody else to become president. So it's all these other things that what ifs that, that make you, you know, make you think about stuff. There's one other coach, yeah. Uh, Well, I guess, you know, before the advent of, of antibiotics, 
you could have a bone infection. You could have a, a smoldering bone infection. Uh, osteomyelitis is called. So I, the, the, the the only way that I can think of what would happen is he had a chronic, what we call chronic osteomyelitis, he had a chronic infection in the bone um, that, you know, again, without the advent of antibiotics, there's no other way, there's no way to treat it. And so if you had a chronic infection, I guess that you could say that he had, he continued to have problems after the, um, um, after the wound that many years later. Um, that would be the only way that I could think of it would have to be a chronic osteomyelitis or something that would, would have been a direct cause of the, of the injury. Okay. You're welcome. Then no, or not. Okay, one more. Yeah, how close was the muzzle of, of the hair to the back of my head? Anybody ever asked me? Nowadays, they have ballistic gummy, you know, with the skull. Very good question. And I didn't put all that. There's a lot of technical stuff in here I didn't put in here. Um, they, during the autopsy, someone mentioned that there was no powder burns around the entrance wound. And so, you know, when you, when you, sh when you shoot into close range, you get what's called tattooing. You get some of the powder actually embeds itself into the skin and stuff. And that's, that's a fairly close shot. They actually, Woodward or whoever, I can remember which ones, they actually mentioned that there was no, there was no powder burns around the, um, around the entrance, which means that Booth was at least several feet away. Um, so it was not a very close shot. It was probably at least three, four feet away from him in order there not to be any powder burns into the skin. Um, so yes, yeah, so nobody knows for sure, but it wasn't directly, it wasn't, it wasn't within a foot or so, uh, otherwise it would have been powder burns. I didn't put those, that technical stuff in it. It was a very good question, but, but he had to be several feet away based on, based on those ballistics, as we know from what they told us about the, about the wound. So good question. Thank you. We had one more question online. Um, Martin asks, because you'd mentioned that he could have possibly survived today with modern medicine, um, you know, what was the actual medical cause of his death? Uh, well, it uh, would be, I, I don't know how they, they didn't finish that, but it would have been um, what, an intracerebral hemorrhage, which means bleeding in the, bleeding in the brain caused by the gunshot wound. You know, it's, it's interesting when you do pathology and stuff, you, you know, it's like you had the same thing when we did, you know, the, the uh, Stonewall Jackson book. You know, you have what did he really die? Well, you, you know, everybody dies when their heart stops, right? So, I mean, you know, technically, but you have to do, it's a chain of events. It's what started the chain of events that led to the death, alleged. So, you have to try to go back to see. So, his cause of death would have been a bullet wound causing intracerebral hemorrhage leading to cardiorespiratory arrest. I mean, if you had to do, there was no, there was no death certificate made for Lincoln uh, that we know of. Um, but um, if you had to, I guess you'd say if that's what the cause of death would be. Anything else? No. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate. It. Hope you. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Matt does have some books available. Uh, he'll be right out at the box office and ask any other questions, but I hope everyone will come back next month for Ruth Webster. Thank you. Ready to go? I got a